we had a dear patriot pass away uh, from Bear Witness Central. His name is Teddy Garcia. He passed away this Tuesday. And we, um, one of the big contributions he made, Teddy Garcia was, uh, he was uh, a Cuban, Cuban exile. And um, he saw communism. Uh, and he's dedicated much of his life trying to warn Americans about the evils of communism, but also how, because he saw many of this firsthand, um, he wants to warn people, wanted to warn people, as to the tactics and the strategies that communists use before the actual revolution comes. And uh, <clears throat> so he was very dedicated to the cause. And I want to read an article that we uh, put up at Bear Witness Central just to give you some idea what this man did. And he had a really good contribution towards the end of his life here. A group of courageous activists from Bear Witness Central organization traveled to Washington, DC to conduct a tactical protest named Operation FBI Whistleblowers that would exhort FBI agents to protest internally to speak out to the public about Hillary Clinton's breach of rules for handling of classified material and to send more critical information to WikiLeaks in order to prevent Hillary Clinton from getting the presidency. Three days after the operation was conducted on October 24, 2016, directed by Dr. Ted Garcia, a Bear Witness Central director and spearheaded by members of Bear Witness Central and with assistance from members of Alexandria Tea Party and local patriots, FBI agents from Washington, D.C. and New York City spoke to FBI Director Comey in regards to emails found in Wiener's computer. Dr. Garcia, a Cuban-American who served two terms in the U.S. military in Vietnam, left Cuba fleeing from communism as a teenager, passed away Tuesday, December 5, 2017. Dr. Garcia was a family doctor in Orange Park, Florida, was an entrepreneur, inventor, and patriotic activist. He was profound, he was proud of having conducted the tactical operation at the FBI facility and always commented that it was his great contribution to the United States of America. And if you go to the Bear Witness website, you can actually watch the video um, of what they were doing. It was really remarkable. He was correct. The tactical operation was a success and precipitated Hillary's loss of confidence from many voters and might have saved America. Family, <clears throat> family and friends will miss Dr. Garcia. So I just want to take a moment of silence and just, you know, uh, dedicate that to him. The funeral is today, by the way. And uh, that's why Rolando, who's the president of Bear Witness Central, is not here. He was a dear friend of his. So um, let's just take a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, we have a good lineup of speakers today, as I mentioned earlier. And um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is America under siege. So um, uh, our technical person in the back there, there we go. That's the name of our, um, our conference today. We. The speakers that will speak today are going to really give you a real solid foundation as to what's going on in our country, because there's a lot more than meets the eye. And there is a deliberate effort that's being done, that's been going on for many, many decades, um, that you'll learn about today. Alex Newman, you'll be speaking later, will be speaking on the deep state. Uh, Frank de Verona uh, will also be speaking, and he'll be speaking on the New World Order. And um, Keith Flau will be speaking on education. And then I'll be speaking on the Frankfurt School. So um, I want to go ahead and get started um, with the Frankfurt School, because one of the things that we're going to learn today is not only what they've done to us, but they're what they're getting ready to do to us. OK? So what I'm going to speak on today is what they've actually done to us over the last 80 to 90 years. And it's important. 
um, because uh, Sun Tzu said it best. He said, you don't know your enemy, and I'm paraphrasing him, if you don't know your enemy and you don't know yourself, you're imperiled in, in all your battles, basically. You're going to lose every battle. And that's what's been going on. We've had activists that have been in government and outside of government since the 30s fighting the agenda and fighting the communism that we're seeing today. But we've still seen more and more of it become prevalent in our society and even in government. And you know, you know, it behooves us to think, well, why is that? Why is it that even with the activists in government and outside of government, why is this communism still moving forward? So the answer to that is the Frankfurt School, one of many schools. Uh, it's a school of thought. And we're going to go through the Frankfurt School because you're going to understand, I'm going to try to connect the dots as much as possible to help you understand what they have done to us. And then things that are going on today will make sense. So I want to start off with why is it important for us to, um, to understand the Frankfurt School? Well, two reasons. The Frankfurt School has been one of the most influential think tanks and activist organizations in the 20th century, and they have had a profound but negative impact on American culture. So we're going to briefly go through the history of the Frankfurt School. There's so much to say. This is actually an hour and a half presentation that I'm going to do in probably 50 minutes. So I'm going to move pretty quick. Um, there was a communist, the third communist international back in 1919 was, um, was uh, driven by Lenin. And uh, they came together. There was many delegates that were um, present. You can see a whole laundry list of different socialist and communist party uh, organizations throughout the world that attended that communist international. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom there, uh, Willie Munzenberg. Can't see it, it's in red, but it's kind of hard to see. But we're going to talk about him later because um, there's much to say about him. Um, but this is the policy statement that they developed in, at that symposium. This was back in 1919. Um, the inevitability of the replacement of the capitalist system by the communist social system. That was number one. Number two, the necessary necessity of the proletarian revolutionary struggle for the overthrow of bourgeois governments and for the destruction of the bourgeois state and its replacement by a new type of state, a proletarian uh, state of the Soviet type, which would ensure the transition to a communist society. So you see there that they were already planning almost 100 years ago the demise of Western society at that conference. Um, so when they began to do a review afterwards of how communism was moving throughout the world, they weren't that excited about its movement. So they organized another symposium um, at the Marx Engels Institute in Moscow and these were some of the people that were present. And basically what they did at that symposium was they sat down and decided to, to put together an agenda, uh, a, a bullet point list of what needed to happen in order for them to further communism throughout Western culture. And then when they were finished, they were so excited about their plan that they decided to organize under Felix Guayo, who was one of the uh, founders. His father was a wealthy grain uh, uh, farmer from um, Argentina. And he put the money up to establish the Institute for Social Research. And it was later known as the Frankfurt School. That's where the Frankfurt School gets its name, because it was established at the University of Frankfurt in Frankfurt, Germany. So when the Nazis came to power, they kicked all the communists out. And one of, the one of the communist groups that they kicked out was the Frankfurt School. So what they did is through help from insiders here in the United States and from other organizations, the big think tanks, um, they decided to go ahead and reopen their institute at Columbia University. 
okay? And then from Columbia University, they began to spread from there and um, they went to Princeton, Brandeis, University of California, and others, and they began to spread uh, from there. The Frankfurt School did. So, and uh, these were the different sources of funding that they received. You can see the Rockefeller Foundation uh, was a big part of it. There's a Columbia Broadcasting System and the Hacker Psychiatric Clinic. That's very important, and I'll explain that later, because um, there's some issues that relate to this that are important to understand about the Frankfurt School. Um, so what was their philosophy, okay? Well, when they came together, Georg Lukács was usually the, he was the brainchild, okay, of the Frankfurt School. And this is, this is an article that was written back in Fidelio Magazine in 1992. And this is what was written about Lukács, it says, Lukács identified, this is the philosophy now, Lukács identified that any political movement capable of bringing Bolshevism to the West would have to be, in his words, demonic. It would have to possess the religious power which is capable of filling the entire soul. However, Lukács suggests that such a messianic political movement could only succeed when the individual, the individual, believes that his or her actions are determined not by personal destiny, but by the destiny of the community that has been abandoned in a world that has been abandoned by God. So what they discovered at that symposium and what they decided is they needed to create this kind of a, an idea, okay? The problem was, in Lukács' mind, was that as long as the individual had the belief or even the hope of belief, that his or her divine spark of reason could solve the problems facing society, then that society would never reach the state of hopelessness and alienation which the cause recognized as the necessary prerequisite for a socialist revolution. So you see now that they began to start looking and saying, hmm, Christianity is a target here because that moral fiber that was embedded. See, America was a Christian nation. It was established as a Christian nation. Liberty is based on the Bible. You go back and read our founding fathers, you'll, you'll find it. You go back and read the charters of the colonies, you'll find that there was so much Christianity in them that they understood, our founding fathers understood that um, people could not govern themselves if they were not, had a moral compass. And that's basically what governing ourselves means, is, as Franklin put it, is uh, governing ourselves under God. See, in a, in, in a society where people had, can exercise more restraint, you, needed, you didn't need big government. So um, they understood that, and they decided they needed to attack that. So what was their plan? Okay, they also came up with two bullet points. They concluded at that symposium that the annihilation of Western culture, particularly the Judeo-Christian culture, was necessary. Second, a new cultural form needed to be created to increase the alienation of the population. A new barbarism was needed. So since that point, this was back in the early and late 1920s, they decided that they needed to create a new barbarism in America. Okay, at the same time, Antonio Gramsci had concluded the same thing, and he wrote, when he was in prison, he was a communist, a, a communist from Italy, okay? He was one of the main founders of the Communist Party in Italy, and he was um, later uh, put in jail by Mussolini, and he wrote a series of essays called Prison Notebooks, and this is one of the things he said in Prison Notebooks. He said, the civilized world has been thoroughly saturated with Christianity for 2,000 years. Any country grounded in Judeo-Christian values cannot be overthrown until those roots are cut. But to cut the roots to change culture, a long march through the institutions is necessary. Only then will the power fall into our laps like a ripened fruit. So here you see clearly what their agenda is. Now keep in mind, Antonio Gramsci was admired by Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky based all of his work 
on the writings of Antonio Gramsci. Willy Munzenberg said this, he said, we will make the West so corrupt. Listen to what he says. He says, we will make, he didn't say the West is going to become corrupt, he said, we will make the West so corrupt that it stinks. Those are his words. Okay? The strategy to destroy the Judeo-Christian culture became known as cultural Marxism. Okay? But it has another name. Political correctness. Political correctness is cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism is political correctness. So we'll get into that later. So how have they executed their plan? Well, this is the plan that they came up with. This is from another article in the Catholic Insight, uh, written back in 2009. These were the 11 goals that they set. Emptying the churches, the teaching of sex and homosexuality to children, the promotion of excessive drinking, encouraging the breakdown of the family, the undermining of schools and teachers' authority, controlling and dumbing down of media, the creation of racism offenses, continual change to create confusion, huge immigration to destroy identity, unreliable legal system with bias against victims of crime, and dependency on the state and state benefits. Does any of that sound familiar? <laughs> this is where it comes from. This is what they've been doing. So when you see all these attacks and all this activity in culture, in movies, uh, in media, in cartoons, in curriculum, it's all based on what these Marxists, because remember, they took control. Remember Antonio Gramsci said, he said, we need to do a long march to the institutions, right? What were those institutions? Um, academia, media companies, music industry, movie industry, visual arts, literary arts, churches, seminaries, and the education system. He said, we take control of those institutions that influence culture, we can control and change the culture. And that's what they've been doing. So they decided to avoid the political and go with the social. That's why social change is so important to Marxists, because if they can control, if they can take down the society, they can take down the culture, the politics will follow. That was their strategy. These are some of the things that they attacked. The patriarchy in the family, motherhood, childhood, marriage, the family, and Christianity. And it's in red because Christianity is a big target. Okay. So let's talk about education and what they planned with education. Bertrand Russell, who became a member of the Frankfurt School later on in, uh, in the 50s, he wrote a book called The Impact of Science and Society, 1951, okay? This is before uh, many of us were even born, okay? Uh, maybe some of us, but anyway. Physiology and psychology of four fields of scientific technique which still await development. This is in his book. The importance of mass psychology, psychology of the masses, has been enormously increased by the growth of modern methods of propaganda. Of these, the most influential is education. The social psychologists of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. Then he goes and outlines four things that he said needed to be in education. One, first, the influence of the home is obstructive. That needed to be in education. Second, that not much can be done unless indoctrination begins before the age of 10. Third, that verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. To do what? To change the way people think. So you start to see a little bit of a picture here of not only ideological subversion, but psychological subversion as well. The psychological part is a tactic and a, or strategy that they have been using on us to change the way we think, because that's what they need. And fourth, uh, the opinion that snow is, black, is white must be held to show a morbid taste of ec eccentricity. What did he mean? Well, what he meant was that if you 
see someone teaching that snow is black, but you know snow is white, well, you're attacked. You're an eccentric. See, so they attack you because they don't want people to know that snow is white if they're indoctrinating them into believing that snow is, is black. And that's what they do. And we'll get into more of some of the strategies that they use in education. Uh, now, this is Benjamin Bloom. Benjamin Bloom is one of the most influential um, behavioral psychologists in education. And much of education theory is based on Benjamin Bloom. And he said this. He said the purpose of education was not to teach or educate children. He said it, the purpose of education and the schools is to change the thoughts, feelings, and actions of students. His words, all educational theory is based on not only Benjamin Bloom, but John Dewey, who was a socialist. And he believed the same thing. A large part of what we call good teaching, Benjamin Bloom again, is that the teachers, is the teacher's ability to attain effective objectives through challenging the student's fixed beliefs and getting them to discuss issues. This is how they do it. So if you have a classroom of 50 kids, and let's say two of them are Christians, they go after the Christians to get them to change the way they do. How? By challenging their fixed beliefs. Well, how do you know God created the earth? Look at evolution. They target them on purpose to get them to change the way they think and they feel. And that's how they do it. They do it through intimidation because since the public school system, or because one of the things that they've done is they've changed the way that economics works, where you, you know, they've, they've literally were uh, effective uh, in changing uh, our economic system from a one income system to a two income system. So you can't really live comfortably these days unless there's two incomes, particularly with families. So they understood that, they pre-planned that to get the moms out of the homes and then that way it would force the kids to have to go to the public schools and then the public schools would indoctrinate them and then get them to change the way they think because the stronger influence on the children today is the school system. They get more of their ideals from what they learn in school than what they do in home. Why? Because they spend more time there. See. So they understood that. A scrutiny in the past 50 years, this is from Robert Marzano, okay, writing about Benjamin Bloom. He said, a scrutiny in the past 50 year plus years in education indicates that Bloom's taxonomy has had a significant yet uneven influence on educational theory and practice. What's he saying? He's saying Bloom had an uneven, uneven, uh, influence on education. So it was 90% Benjamin Bloom and 10% everybody else. So what is he saying? He's saying Benjamin Bloom basically defined education. I'll skip this. Um, but um, we've seen a lot of the um, education system go down the twos and um, starting from the 60s, but it actually started even before that. Because what we saw in the 60s with the countercultural revolution was really a fruit. Because Herbert Marcuse was a leading uh, element in the 60s with the Make Love Not War, the big hippie movement. Herbert Marcuse was very um, involved in that. And he was a member of the Frankfurt School. So by the time those kids were, you know, most of us that went to college around that time or even high school, um, we already had that influence. But the groundwork had already been laid. 10 or 20 years before that to reach that point. But Guillaume Dukaj became deputy commissioner of culture, for culture in, in, in Hungary. And one of the first things he did, okay, this is from an article in the American Thinker. Uh, he said, he immediately set plans in motion to de-Christianize Hungary. De-Christianize Hungary. That's what they're doing with us right now. They're trying to de-Christianize our nation. Reasoning that if Christian sexual ethics could be undermined among children, then both the hated patriarchal family and the church would be dealt a crippling blow. Okay? 
Uh, Lukash launched a radical sex education program in his schools. Sex lectures were organized and literature handed out, which graphically instructed youth in free love and sexual intercourse while simultaneously encouraging them to deride and reject Christian moral ethics, monogamy, and parental and church authority. All of this was accompanied by a reign of cultural terror perpetrated against parents, priests, and dissenters. Does that sound familiar? That's what's going on. Media, I'm just gonna say this about media because I wanna to get to the Christian part, it's very, very important. This is Lenin back in 1901, okay? Very important for us to understand this. Because remember, we don't know our enemy and we don't know ourselves, we're gonna lose every battle. We need to understand this. A newspaper is not only a collective propagandist or and a collective agitator, it is also a collective organizer. So when we watch the news today, the news, the media is controlled by at the highest levels by Marxists. That's why we have such terrible media today, that's why they're so left wing. Okay, they've been captured, they were captured, you know, decades ago. But every time we watch the news, we're either propagandized, we're either agitated, or we're either organized. Why? Because the media controls the message. They decide what we should know and what we shouldn't know. That's a problem, because many of us depend on the media I'm gonna read something that was written by Edward Bernays about that. We depend on the media for our information. So this is what they're doing, okay? All right, I'll skip drugs, but there's a lot to say there. Um, okay, oops. Oh, I need my technical person here, there we go. All right, oops, here we go, entertainment. Um, we'll skip that too because we'll talk a little bit about it because this one's pretty obvious. Anybody watch the sitcoms of today? They're, just, uh, they're, they're a total disgrace, okay? Well, that disgrace is not accidental. It didn't happen by accident. It's been a deliberate effort and they use these TV shows and entertainment for the sole purpose of propagandizing us, to change the way we think, to make those issues that they bring up in media, whether it's in movies, in cartoons, in the news, make those issues as if American society is not only that, but that it is normal. They really want to condition us to think that way. Okay, now Giyosh Lukash, remember him from earlier? The one who said that we needed to um, create a world abandoned by God? He wrote a book in 1910 called Soul and Form, where he promotes the abolition of culture. And one of the things he argues in that book is that the arts are an excellent means to degenerate culture to create cultural hatred or cultural pessimism. Well, that's what the movies are doing. That's what, the, that's what uh, novels do. That's what sitcoms do. That's what motion pictures do. That's the whole purpose. They're not there for entertainment. These are examples of music, you know, songs that we've heard growing up, some of us. If you listen to the lyrics of many of these word, of these um, songs, you find that it's all either anti-Christian, anti-relationship, demonic, I mean, you name it. Um, these are three movies that have heavy propaganda in them. And now, particularly Car, uh, Toy, uh, Cars 2 was very heavy in sustainable development propaganda. Infiltration of the church, that's the big one. That's the one I want to talk about because this one's very important. This is Lenin, he said this. He said, our propaganda necess necessarily includes the propaganda of atheism. He also said that atheism and communism 
are synonymous. Okay. This is from the Communist Manifesto. But communism abolishes eternal truths, it abolishes all religion and all morality, instead of constituting them on a new basis. It therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical evidence. Well, that's a really arrogant statement that Karl Marx made. What is he saying? He's saying, look, communism abolishes eternal truths, religion, and morality, and constitutes them on a new basis. We're going to do it anyway, even though it contradicts historical precedent. So history says that when you abolish these things, eventually things kind of turn around, kind of, sort of. He's saying, look, we're going to do this anyway, even though it contradicts historical evidence. This is from the antiquity of the Jews, OK? Because what we have to understand is that the ideas of communism, the ideas of totalitarianism that you know, we've seen in the last few hundred years, or even in the last thousand years, really, you can go back to, you, know, you saw totalitarianism with Nimrod, I mean with um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, you saw it in Rome, you saw it in Greece, you know, you go back to Egypt, you know, the ideas are basically the same. But look at this, look at what Josephus wrote back 2,000 years ago in the, the antiquity of Jews. He said, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man, and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God, as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured their happiness. He gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God. This is what Lukash was saying. But to bring them into a constant dependence on his power, Nimrod's power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying his forefathers. This is 2,000 years ago. Now, there's one statement that's on here that sounds kind of familiar. It says, it, it says, he persuaded them not to ascribe it to God. In other words, everything that comes, everything that good that we have in our lives comes from God. There's nothing that happens in our lives, okay? If we invoke God into our lives, he will bless our lives and he will intervene in our lives, okay? And much of what we have and what we have to be thankful for is really not on account of what we've done for ourselves, but what has God either done for us or what he has allowed to come and happen to us or with us, see? He's saying, we got to get rid of that, okay? And he convinced them that it's by their own power and their own means that they could be happy. But it's really interesting because I was just reading this just last night. Um, this is from the third, the humanist, the third humanist manifesto that was written in 19 or 2003. This is the last statement that the humanist manifesto says. Number three it says, "Thus engaged in the." Thus engaged in the flow of life, we humanists aspire to the vision with the informed conviction that humanity has the ability to progress towards its highest ideals. The responsibility for our lives and the kind of world in which we live is ours and ours alone. Further up in the beginning of it, it talks about how we don't need divine intervention in order for us to procure our happiness. Where did they get that? Well, they got that from this. Okay, these are the different ideas that the Frankfurt School has been promoting. Social justice, Gnosticism, the changing of Bible translations, uh, the shifting of church music, the drop-off Sunday schools, the concept of equality, women pastors, social issues, silence in the pulpit. That's a big one, okay? Um, Paul Kangor wrote a, a, uh, uh, an article 
called War on Religion, and he said this about communism. He said, the roots of this hatred and intolerance of religion lie in the essence of communist ideology. Marx dubbed religion the opiate of the masses and opined that, quote, communism begins where atheism begins. Speaking on behalf of the Bolsheviks in his famous October 2nd, 1920 speech, Lenin stated matter-of-factly, we do not believe in God. Lenin insisted that all worship of a divinity is a necrophilia. He wrote in November 1913 letter that any religious idea, any idea of a God at all, any flirtation even with the God, is the most inexpressive foulness, the most dangerous foulness, the most shameful infection. And what he meant by infection was venereal disease. So he compared um, Christianity, religion, with a venereal disease. That's what he called, that's how much he hated Christianity. He goes on in that article, he says, communists quibble over the details of how to implement Marx's vision, but they were unanimous in one thing. Uh, religion was the enemy, a rival to Marxist mind control. And it had to be vanquished regardless of cost and difficulties. Why do you think the left concerns themselves with social issues, but yet we can't talk about those social issues? Well, this is why. They want it to be a one-sided argument where it's not challenged. Can't talk about abortion. Can't talk about um, euthanasia. We can't talk about homosexuality. We can't talk about any of these issues. They can talk about it, but we can't. And then we've been indoctrinated and conditioned into believing that that is how we need to be. So what we wind up doing is we wind, be, we wind up being silent and their ideas go unchallenged. And guess what? If Americans lose their moral voice, what do you think is gonna happen to the culture? And that silencing has been deliberate. Okay, so this, um, I'm gonna end with this here. Um, this is from a hearing back in 1966 by the founder of Voices of the Martyrs. His name was Reverend Richard Wormrand. And this is not Senator Dodd that we know. But this is a different senator does. He says, how do communists use religion in their own purposes if they do? He responded, this is a very tragic sight. The worst thing in Romania, because that's where he was captured. He was captured in Romania and he was tortured for many years. And then they released him and he came and testified in Congress. The worst thing in Romania has not been the persecution of Christians. Persecution has made the Christians to be of steel. The worst thing has been the corruption of religion. They have put as religious leaders their man. The subcommittee has received substantial information to the effect that Romanian communist government has infiltrated in this country communist trained clergy with other missions than those of a spiritual nature. Do you have any information about that? He responds, Romanian communists are very interested in the fact that they have here, this is in 1966, something like 300,000 on their side. They can't very well win them for communism, this is the important part, but they can win them for a left-wing Christianity that supports communism, okay? In prison, there were not only priests and pastors, we have had hundreds of peasants and young boys and girls who were in prison for their Christian faith. These were separated and for them was a special brainwashing. Not only that communist is good, but Christianity is dead. Christianity is dead. Christianity is dead. That's how they tortured the younger generation. And they kept, they kept saying, nobody more believes in Christ. Nobody more believes in Christ. You are the only fools. This is how they were tortured. And that's how they converted many people through that conditioning and a psychological torture. It's almost kind of like MK Ultra that was being applied on them. So Thomas Jefferson said, all tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for good people of conscience to remain silent. And what I'll argue, ladies and gentlemen, is that, and I've been arguing it for some time, we gotta stop being silent. 
we got to speak up. And where do we do that? We do that in our own homes, with our own families, with our own children. We have got to speak up and be that moral voice. Because if we don't do it, nobody else will. The only foundation on a useful education in a republic is to be, whoop, uh, is to be aid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue, and without virtue, there can be no liberty. And liberty is the object and life of all Republican governments, not democracies, because our founding fathers hated democracies. Okay? Without religion, I believe that learning does a real mischief to the morals and principles of mankind. Uh, William Penn said, those people who will not be governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. Patrick Henry said this, it cannot be emphasized too strongly too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. So, um, my time is running a little short. How am I doing on time there? Seven minutes. Okay, I'm going to make this really quick. Um, this is a political spectrum on morality. It's based on the political spectrum of political power. Because zero government is on the far right. You know, they want to tell you that fascism's on the far right and communism's on the far left, and then moderates are in the middle. That's a false uh, spectrum. The true spectrum is anarchy, zero political power on the far right, and then totalitarianism on the far left. Where you get fascism and communism and socialism and monarchies and all these isms and all these uh, totalitarian systems, okay, dictators, all those are on the far left. But if you notice on this graph here, we have that um, if the more morality exists in a society, the less government is needed. The more immorality there is in a society, the more government is needed. And that's the strategy that these totalitarians use. They want to create a barbaric culture to justify why people cannot govern themselves and they need government to rule over them to keep them in check. Okay? So I want to um, close with. Um, uh, if you guys want to take pictures of this, you can. These are recommended reading here, okay? Uh, well, no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Here's the educational list, list of educational material. Um, if you've never heard of the 5,000 year leap, you need to read the 5,000 year leap. If you've never watched the documentary Monumental, you need to watch the documentary Monumental. If you've never seen Agenda Grinding America Down, which by the way, uh, Trevor Loudon, he's on there, he's one of our speakers. You'll see him a lot on that video. Excellent. Really opens your eyes. Uh, the 10 DVD series uh, from David Barton called America's Christian Heritage, a must see. Another one is Overview of America from the John Birch Society. I believe we have a representative of the John Birch Society right here, the lady in the um, yellow uh, coat there. Um, and the Quigley formula, that's another one now. You can Google that. That's with G. Edward Griffin, OK? Um, there's other ones. There's another one called Shadows of Power. I believe that book is being sold there. There's another one there. Uh, actually, those three books that you see sitting up there, Alex Newman's is one of those. It's Crimes of the Educators. Those are excellent books, all three of those that are there. Those are must-reads. We really need to start educating ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, because they are after us, and they're after us hard. And now, with Trump being in office, uh, basically uh, breaking down their whole totalitarian system, we have a golden opportunity to take back our country and educate the next generation. But before we can do that, we have to educate ourselves. And I'm I'm challenging everybody here today, don't assume that you know. 
Um, you'll be surprised what you don't know when you start going through this material here. And that's important. That's okay. If we're going to educate the next generation, and if we're going to help our family members, and if we're going to really be a voice that makes a difference for the restoration of liberty, we must know this material. Okay? So, amen? amen. All right.